Welcome to the new headquarters of News UK. I hope you like the building. I hope you like the views. It's a big change from our previous offices, if any of you have been there back in Wapping. We were there for 28 years, and we now rather feel like we've been welcomed back to civilization. <laughs> this, uh, this event was born out of two golden anniversaries, that of the Sunday Times business section and of the London Business School, which we are very proud to have tonight as a co-organiser. You'll hear more in the latter, uh, about the latter in a minute from Sir Andrew, but I'll tell you a little, about, little bit about our history and our anniversary. So 1964 was an interesting year for the Sunday Times. The then editor, Dennis Hamilton, had already made Fleet Street history by publishing what was Britain's first colour supplement, what we now know as the Sunday Times magazine. Uh, he thought that there was an opportunity for another first, a separate, standalone business section. Now, it sounds like a commonplace today, but back then, this was really quite radical thinking. These were the days, in, in case we've forgotten, before corporation tax, before capital gains tax, 25 years, quarter of a century before the FTSE 100. But, as the launch of the London Business School in the same year showed, things were changing. Hamilton sensed what was going on. Britain was really waking up to business. So there were many naysayers. Internally, definitely, people thought it was a doomed project. There would be no news on a Sunday, for one thing. There would be no advertising. And let's face it, business is a very dull, dry subject. Why not just leave all that to the specialists? Now, they were all wrong, of course, and Hamilton was right. There was news on a Sunday. There was an avalanche of advertising, and some of that advertising, if you look back at the old sections, is quite quaint by today's standards. There are constant invocations for businessmen, because it was businessmen, to buy the woman in their life what they really wanted, which was a Remington typewriter. <laughs> and, and business, as the public was starting to realize, was not dull. It was actually a fascinating mix of technology, politics, finance, and above all, great personalities, great people. It was the personalities that made it shine and made our section a success. Personalities like many of those in the audience and certainly our speakers here tonight. So that was how our business section, uh, the first in, British, in uh, British journalism launched, and still the best, and we, uh, we have the figures to prove it. That was how it launched. Now, in that first section, September the 27th, 1964, there was an advertisement for a new, a brand new post, a brand new job in British life. It was for the first principal of the London Graduate School of Business Studies, what became LBS. It said uh, he will be paid, I hope this applies to Sir Andrew, he will be paid on a scale comparable to the head of a university and he will be able to accept outside directorships. That sounds to me like a perfect introduction to our next speaker who will introduce the debate, the Dean of London Business School, Sir Andrew Lickierman. Andrew. Oh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Dominic, and a very good evening, everyone. Delighted to welcome you to tonight's event on behalf of the co-host of the London Business School. Fifty years ago, when both the London Business School and Sunday Times Business News were born, the UK was seen to be, if you remember, those of you who are around, in a period of unprecedented transition, and that was only the Beatles. Little did we know, papers were only printed and from hot metal. Higher education was only lectures. Academic information was posted through the letterbox. This morning, I read my times on my tablet and later discussed our new MOOC, that's Massive Online Open Course. Hot desking has replaced hot metal at the Times newspapers, I'm told. Posting, of course, is electronic, not letterbox. But Times newspapers and the London Business School are both class acts. We have adopted and used technology and will continue to do so. And the emphasis on quality hasn't changed either. LBS was founded as a centre of excellence, and after 50 years, we're judged by others, including one with pink paper, as unambiguously one of the world's leading business schools. But it's not merely birthdays that have brought us together. It was in the very earliest years of both that the link was made. Ball, Burns, more from him in a moment, and Bud, I'm glad to see also here tonight, put the school on the map publicly by producing the independent economic forecasts of the day. It not only sold the newspaper, but established the school's public reputation. And that reputation was continued over the years by many eminent faculty in the public domain of economics and finance. It also set up a long-standing relationship between national policymakers and the school, 
with faculty and alumni filling senior roles in government, and now two alumni as cabinet ministers. But that is only the impact in the public domain, not visible because it's inside organizations of all kinds, public and private, startups and multinationals, are the contributions of thousands of graduates and tens of thousands of executives. I also believe we've been instrumental in moving thinking about management education as being an optional extra to an essential for professional development and international competitiveness. As I keep saying, you don't have amateur brain surgeons, why should you have amateur managers? To celebrate our birthday, we've been tracking the impact we've had over the five decades. It's a great story. It's also illustrated an ironic twist to the aspirations of 50 years ago. Then, one of the hopes was the school would produce graduates for British manufacturing. 50 years on, Jaguar Land Rover, having been saved once by one of our first ever graduates, Sir John Egan, is now run by Tata, run by another of our graduates, Cyrus Mystery. Add Tata Steel and Jim Radcliffe's pivotal role in petrochemicals, and the London Business School is perhaps at last fulfilling its promise on manufacturing. The fact that the two alumni are based abroad only serves to underline how much the school and the UK have moved over the last 50 years. When I first arrived 40 years ago, arrived at the London Business School 40 years ago, <laughs> just to be clear, <laughs> I'm not claiming anything here, 90% of the faculty and staff and most of the students were British. We now have students from 106 countries on campus, staff from 60, and faculty from 31. We're proud to be in the UK, but of the world. 50 years ago, the very first edition of the Sunday Times Business section ran, as you've heard, a feature on the newly opened London Business School. I'm delighted these two great British institutions are together again tonight to celebrate our 50th anniversaries. And with that, I'd like to hand over to David Smith, Economics Editor of the Sunday Times and Chair of tonight's event. Um, good evening, everybody, and let me uh, add my welcome to, uh, to those you've already had. And uh, it's a, a special occasion for, uh, for me, as well as for, uh, um, uh, for the LBS and the Sunday Times. I've been here at the Sunday Times for 25 of those uh, 50 years. Um, I've still got the short trousers I wore on my first day. Uh, so it's, it, and it's good to be here. And also, for reasons too complicated to explain here, um, I owe my career in journalism to the uh, relationship between the uh, Sunday Times and the uh, London Business School. Now, over the 50 years, plenty has changed, as uh, Dominic uh, and Andrew have said. Um, we've been visited by the, uh, the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse. We've had crises, booms, busts, uh, devaluation, 27% inflation, winters of discontent, banking meltdown, Black Mondays, Black Wednesdays, and some pretty dark Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays as well. Um, so, uh, but there have been some good times as well, and um, uh, the question tonight is uh, whether Britain has been uh, good for uh, business. We have an expert uh, panel, some with uh, an LBS connection, all regularly written about by the Sunday Times, who are going to address that, uh, that uh, topic. And the format is that I'll introduce the, uh, the panel, each, each of the panel members, They'll speak for a few minutes, then we'll discuss some of the uh, topics raised uh, among ourselves, then we'll open it up to your questions, which I'm sure will be uh, tougher than mine. So on the panel we have uh, Lord Terry Burns, uh, a very old friend who's moved from a very successful career in economics and as the Treasury's top civil servant to a career in business and his current roles as chairman of uh, both Santander and uh, Channel 4. Uh, next is Carolyn McCall, Chief Executive for the past four, uh, four years of EasyJet and one of our most successful women business leaders. And at EasyJet, she's successfully pursued a strategy of taking EasyJet increasingly into the uh, business market. Then we have uh, Jim Ratcliffe, Chief, uh, who's Chairman of INEOS since 1998 and has nearly four decades of experience in the chemicals industry. Uh, Jim has grown INEOS to be one of the world's biggest chemical companies and is also a London Business School uh, MBA. Uh, last but not least, we have Sir Martin Sorrell, founder and CEO of WPP, which today is the world's largest provider of advertising and market communication services with a market capitalization of over 16 billion. And at one stage during the Sunday Times business section's 50-year history, uh, WPP was known for its uh, supermarket baskets, as uh, Martin may tell us, uh, now it has a big say in how those baskets are filled. 
So can I ask the panel to, uh, to uh, kick us off and uh, for Terry to start by, uh, with his comments, uh, setting the scene. Terry. Thank you very much, David. <coughs> it's just over 49 years ago that I joined the London Business School as a 21-year-old researcher working for Professor Jim Ball, now Sir James Ball. And I was put to work on helping Jim to construct an econometric model of the UK economy with the aim of trying to make forecasts and to evaluate policy options. And towards the end of 1966, our first forecast was published in what was, as you've heard, the relatively new Sunday Times business uh, news. And I was the joint author of those forecasts three times a year, first with Jim and then subsequently with Alan Budd, uh, until I left the business school at the end of, of 1979 to go to the, uh, to the Treasury. And so, for me, this is a very special uh, occasion to celebrate both the 50th anniversary of the school next year, combined with the 50th anniversary of the Sunday Times uh, business news. I'm going to try and say just a few words about, uh, uh, through the lens of really the three phases of my working life, one which was at the business school, the second which was at the Treasury, and the third working with a variety of companies since I left the Treasury. Uh, first, the business school years, and I think the uh, the, the main feature here, of course, is that they really were turbulent uh, years. The emphasis uh, of the national economic debate during this time was almost entirely centered on macroeconomic issues. And until the recession of 74, 75, the dominant questions were about demand management, about the debate between things like devaluation or import controls, how to design incomes policy. As far as there was a separate industrial policy, it seemed to center increasingly on how to support industry, whether they were the declining industries like coal and manufacturing, or as hoped by Harold Wilson, those forged in the white heat of scientific uh, revolution. But as I said, those years were turbulent. We had major exchange rate uncertainty, we had damaging strikes, quadrupling of the oil prices, uh, all culminating in the three-day working week in the early months of 1974. Inflation, as David said, peaked at around 25%. We had a severe recession, huge budget deficit, and of course the IMF arrived in 1976 to help us to try to sort out our problems. And I think it was the, uh, the final years, of course, of the 70s which saw policymakers trying to find some solutions to these uh, problems, although uh, you know, those problems which had really bedeviled a decade, but unfortunately the decade ended up with a major trade union dispute and the winter of discontent. I don't think looking back on those years that anyone would now say that this was a great environment for business to, to prosper. The UK economy was not performing well relative to the other major European countries. And of course, we were also facing the emergence of countries like Japan as a real global economic uh, force. And it was around this time that I, I joined the Treasury in, in January 1980, and it coincided with a period uh, of, of major reform, both in terms of macroeconomic policy and also what we came to call supply side uh, policy. On the macro side, it was about giving more emphasis to monetary and fiscal control, trying to halt the increasing share of public expenditure in GDP. On the supply side reform, it included the abolition of foreign exchange controls, privatization of state-owned enterprises, reductions of high marginal tax rates, greater emphasis on competition, and, and of course curbs on, on trade union power. Of course, this was not an easy time either, particularly in the, in the early years. The recession of 79 to 81 was severe. Unemployment increased uh, rapidly. The implementation of monetary policy turned out to be much more complicated than expected, partly because many of the financial reforms had the effect of, of obscuring the interpretation of the, of the data. But I think looking back now, you can see that from around about 82, 83 onwards, <coughs> the UK economy did begin to perform in relative terms uh, better than it had done. It began to, uh, to, to grow at rates which were much more similar to the other major European countries. And I'll go through this, I don't, I don't want to go through this in great detail, but of course <coughs> the issues that are scarred on my memory is how this, what was quite an extensive period of good growth performance ran into uh, price, uh, housing price bubble, soaring interest rates at the end of the 70s, that coincided with, of course, major events that we've just been celebrating, the, uh, the fall of the, uh, the Berlin Wall. Uh, we also had the, the debate about the UK and European monetary integration, 
which was a very active subject in the second half of the uh, 80s and the early 90s. The climax for me came in 1992 when we had the ERM crisis, Black Wednesday, in the September of that, uh, that year, which was an extraordinarily damaging experience. But it was followed by implementing this program of inflation targeting, giving much greater uh, powers to the, to the Bank of England. And, and again, looking back, one can then see that we really had quite an extensive period of long, uh, a long period of low stable inflation, low uh, good and stable uh, growth rates. And indeed, there was to such an extent that by the time we got to two, 2006, uh, five, six, seven, people began to think that we had at last actually cracked the problems of, uh, of UK economic uh, performance. Uh, this also coincided with uh, that whole period of stable and really rather good performance with this enormous uh, surge to globalization. Of course, at the moment, this picture has become somewhat clouded because this long period of stability ended in tears, as have many other periods of very good uh, performance. And it, the end came because what has been described, of course, as rational, uh, irrational exuberance, the emergence of bad real estate debts in the US, an abrupt freezing of the interbank market, huge losses on financial securities, and really a full-blown banking crisis in the advanced countries, which I have had either the fortune or misfortune, depends on which, which way you look at it, to work uh, through. And what I tried to do in, in, in thinking about this topic was to think through, you know, what I, the perspective I've had from the, uh, the companies that I have, have worked in since I left the, uh, the Treasury. My general conclusion, in fact, is that the UK economy has performed well over this past 20 years or, or so. There are some important qualifications. Uh, clearly, it doesn't apply to all sectors, and we'll note out here that manufacturing in particular has struggled against the competition of global competitors. Our skill levels have not always kept up with the changing needs of industry. The fact that there have been four major recessions during my working life, I think, has created significant uncertainties for business, particularly in the SME sector. And in those periods of austerity, <coughs> I would conclude that actually, generally, too much of the burden has been at the expense of capital and infrastructure uh, spending. However, when I look at the businesses that I have been more closely uh, involved in, I think that my conclusions are, are, are more favorable than, than that. First, in terms of, uh, you know, if I think of banking, where I spent a lot of the last uh, 15 years, despite the events of the, of the past few years, I still see the, the growth of financial services in London as a huge success story, along with the associated advisory businesses that have grown up around it, including accounting, legal firms, and management consultancies. Uh, the success as an international finance center, I think, is founded on a number of, of important facts. Uh, the extent to which we have welcomed talented individuals from around the world, the fact that our markets have been open to overseas businesses investors, the benefits of the, of the rule of law, and of course, a number of things specifically tied to English. I think we deliberately avoided trying to defend local businesses that couldn't keep up with, with foreign competition. And all of those things, I think, have played a very significant part in what has been the development of this extraordinary site that we can see out of our window. When I look at the media and the creative industries where I'm also involved, I think there are some very similar things, although there are some, a lot of special factors as well. But again, I think what we see are the benefits from an approach that has encouraged competition and, uh, and innovation. And with the UK's diverse broadcasting and creative uh, ecology, the media industry has, uh, has flourished and it has helped to keep up very high level of domestic activity and huge numbers of UK-based independent television companies. Some of them, of course, are now being bought by US companies and there is a very close relationship between many of our UK companies and US companies, but which continue to produce programs in the UK and sell programs around the world. In, I also had a spell as chairman of a, of a water company, and I think it is quite interesting, although there's not, there are some differences, of course, in terms of the different utilities, but some of the things that, one, uh, that I saw in that industry also, and the extent to which uh, open markets played quite a significant part. And I think it's not easy to exaggerate 
the, the difference between the industries that I knew way back in my LBS days from what we, we see now. I mean, those industries which were once bound by treasury rules, which were underinvested, and that was very clear in the water industry, with almost no customer focus, those have been uh, transformed. And in some cases, it has been because of the international success of UK businesses, and in others, it's because overseas businesses have come and invested in the, in the UK. So my, my concluding thoughts are that actually Britain has, has thrived because we have been open to foreign investment and talent. We've been ready to instigate supply-side reforms, including competition. The UK's willingness to adapt itself to globalization has positioned us well for what has happened over the past 25 years, particularly in the high-end knowledge uh, industries. We've provided a platform in which business has thrived, irrespective of national ownership, not just in banking and media, but also in industries such as motor manufacturing, utilities, and if we've heard, of course, steel. I think we would all like to see successful businesses that are headquartered in the UK. And of course, there are some areas which do need protection of core national interests. But foreign investors can also be a source of, of growth, of access to overseas markets, of fresh capital, and even expertise to boost productivity and diversification. And of course, I see this through my relationship with Santander. Finally, I am in no doubt about the importance of the legislative and regulatory framework within which business operates. And generally, my experience has been that these have worked pretty well, although inevitably regulators and legislators don't get everything right, and they've got to be prepared to adapt to changing circumstances when mistakes are, are made. So I, my overall uh, conclusion is that uh, I believe that openness that we have seen in this country is a sign of self-confidence, that we can hold our own in a competitive world, both as a place to, to develop businesses and as a place for other people to run their business. And uh, this openness, to me, means that Britain is now a much better place to do business than it was 50 years ago, and I hope that this is also going to stand us in very good stead for the future. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this event. Uh, the Sunday Times business section has been part of my working life for as long as I can remember. I can say that now. I had 24 years at the Guardian Media Group, and so I used to have to deny that uh, every time I walked in on a Monday morning uh, because I used to find out all my kind of business leads, really, from the Sunday Times uh, business section. And, of course, from a commercial perspective, the front page Solus uh, which is, the, you know, is one of the most sought-after advertising spots in British media. I would never have said that when I was at The Guardian, so there you go. Uh, now, over the last 50 years, the business sector, of course, has been great for insight and analysis. Um, and I think the debate tonight um, is quite a complex question. Uh, and I'm going to use the aviation industry, it's not the media industry, because with Terry's insight, and certainly with Martin's, I think uh, media and creative services and uh, and marketing services are going to be very well covered. So I thought actually the aviation industry uh, may provide a lens through which to examine the question and to illustrate some of the wider developments in the British econ economy over the last 50 years. So 50 years ago, um, if any of you can remember that far back, was reserved, uh, when, you, when you thought about flying, it was reserved for the elite traveling on government-owned airlines. My father, to this day, wears a suit when he travels, and he's traveled widely, and he's a businessman. And honestly, that's how it was. Most flights were operated by state-owned carriers. Main airports were owned by national governments. Airfares were subject to really tight regulation and restrictions. Uh, you probably remember as little as 18 years ago that wherever you went in Europe, it cost you 250 quid, roughly. And actually, a one-way ticket was exactly the same price as a return ticket. So, um, you know, really, really high airfares. Governments decided how many airlines flew between countries, usually one flag carrier only. The number of flights was decided on and the level of fares charged. Slots, which are the vital and highly prized means of flying from the most attractive airports to the most attractive airports, were jealously guarded by the flag carriers. They could not be traded. So you had no new entrants ever. Now, some things don't change. In 1965, 
plans were published to develop a six-runway airport on the Isle of Sheppey. <laughs> and any guesses? Any, anyone to guess what airport that was going to replace? <laughs> Heathrow. Heathrow. In 1965. S yeah, well. In the 70s, the liberalization process started. Over the 80s and 90s, Britain deregulated or privatized all those things that I mentioned. This led to EasyJet actually being born in 1995 and other non-flag carriers being created, resulting in a British airline industry, which is now actually the largest in Europe. Today, two of Europe's big five are UK listed and Europe's largest tour operator, travel operator, is British. As Dominic and his predecessors would agree, and as you mentioned, I think, Dominic, in your introduction, the dynamism and drama of the aviation market has provided acres of uh, coverage and newsprint in the business section over its lifetime. The central narrative has charted the battles between state-owned or state-backed airlines against the upstart entrepreneurs like Freddie Laker, Michael Bishop, Richard Branson, and of course, Stelios. Britain has been good for these businesses, and these airlines have improved the quality of the privatized British Airways. As a result, air travel today is significantly more accessible to every consumer. The total number of passengers arriving or departing from a UK airport in 1964 was just over 17 and a half million. Last year, the equivalent figure was 228 million a 13-fold increase. So there are any number of benefits which come with this growth, and many of you will know exactly what these are. The exponential growth in mobility has encouraged trade, supported the movement of skills, which Terry mentioned, to the UK economy, and of course has enabled people to travel to places they wouldn't have dreamt of, and also visit friends and fam family. So the connectivity is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's incomprehensible, I think, from 20 years ago. A striking example is the number of tourists visiting the UK. Again, it's grown 15-fold. Fewer than 2 million tourists visited the UK in the early 60s. Today, 30 million do so each year. As a result, the UK travel and tourism sector is worth £170 billion, accounts for over 10% of our economy. Over 4 million jobs, directly or indirectly, are supported by travel and tourism. That's 12.5% of total employment in the UK. So I think this reflects a broader trend in the British economy over the last half century of the rise of the service sector, again alluded to by Terry, in terms of jobs and GDP compared to manufacturing. But it is worth pointing out that a significant proportion of the manufacturing that still takes place in Britain is actually in aviation and aerospace. We have the largest aerospace industry in Europe and are second only to the US in the world. UK aerospace revenue is over £24 billion. The sector provides more than 230,000 highly paid jobs and highly specialist jobs. So another reflection on the changes in business in Britain over the last five de decades is the increasing importance, of course, of Europe, the world's largest trading bloc. Trade with the rest of Europe is a mainstay of the British economy, accounting for almost half of our exports. Our success, EastJet's success, was driven by a number of factors coming together. The liberalization, as I mentioned earlier, but that, and that was accompanied by the rise of the internet. But there is no question that without Europe um, and the EU's open skies, the success of EastJet, in fact, I don't think we would have been born. I think we are actually a product of that deregulization and liberalization. We are a child of the EU. We have 26 bases in seven countries across Europe employing pilots and cabin crew on local contracts fully compliant with each country's social legislation. Why am I telling you that? Simply because I mention this because it gives us an insight really into us as an employer or, or how, how easy it is actually um, to work in Britain. Um, we have a much simpler, easier environment in which to do business. We've encouraged more uh, inward investment than other European states because it's easier to set up a business here easier to performance manage people. I think this will resonate with any of you that have tried to do business um, in some European countries. We have more flexible labor laws and low levels of corporation and other tax. Workers are highly protected here, but the focus is on individual, not collective rights. No other major economy in Europe went through a revolution equivalent to that seen in Britain in the 1980s. 
And as a result, we have a much more flexible economy which can respond, and we have responded as EasyJet, to the rapid changes in the macroeconomic environment and indeed to consumer behaviour. We've taken full advantage of that. In our experience, so therefore, the British economy is structurally in better shape than most, if not all, of its European competitors. Now, the European picture is not all positive. It won't be of a surprise to any of you to know that or to hear that. The Achilles heel of the European Union remains the unnecessary regulation, the unnecessary bureaucracy, which has little consumer support and adds a lot of cost and complexity to businesses. In addition, the liberalization of aviation in the UK has not been matched across Europe. Many airports to this day remain state-owned. Restrictions re remain in support services like ground handling and slot trading and change in the management of air traffic control services, which we all rely on to fly, is glacially slow. I mean, it's painful. Although Britain led the way in Europe and uh, in terms of deregulation, which created a dynamic private sector aviation industry, I think it's fair to say that Britain hasn't had an aviation policy for many, many years. And indeed, as I, as I demonstrated by the 1964 example, and indeed it has lacked a long-term transport infrastructure policy. The lack of expansion in aviation infrastructure specifically, especially in the Southeast, has suppressed demand and has led to congestion and delays. And Terry, you must have been in the government actually, you must have been in the Treasury in 1979, when they actually said that Heathrow's capacity was virtually exhausted. Those are their exact words. The, U, the view of the UK's political parties is at best short term and at worst focused on the impacts rather than the benefits of aviation. The economic benefit the sector tends to be counted solely in the three billion pounds we collect on the Treasury's behalf in air passenger duty. No other European country levies a tax on passengers at the level of the UK's, nowhere near. In fact, most of them have abolished that. Um, so when I meet uh, ministers in other European countries, there is cross-party political alignment on developing transport infrastructure and aviation within that, so surface access, and the six runways at Schiphol Airport and the four runways at Charles, Charles de Gaulle just prove that. UK politicians of all parties now talk passionately and proudly of the very recent and proposed investments in road and rail infrastructure, rarely mention aviation. Now, I'm not criticizing the investment in road and rail, uh, but this simply alone cannot uh, provide quick and affordable transport links with the UK, within the UK, uh, never mind with the rest of the world. The UK needs a policy for the long term that provides a roadmap for the expansion of airport infrastructure and the surface access by road and rail to our airports. This so far, I believe, has been extremely bad for business and I would really hope that the Howard uh, Davis Commission is the last review we see on this and that a government, whichever government it is, is brave enough to take his recommendations and run with them. In summary, on balance, the aviation industry shows that Britain has been good, if perhaps not great, for business over the last five decades. And overall, I would say Britain has been good for business. Business today, businesses today want Britain to continue to make it simple and efficient to do business here and to continue to invest in skills and infrastructure to enable British businesses to trade with and compete with the rest of the world. I think the biggest question that hangs over Britain today is actually that of Europe. The success of Britain and its businesses over the next 50 years requires that question to be answered clearly and positively. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I was going to start by saying I'm one of those increasingly rare breeds in the UK that actually manufactures stuff. Until about 30 minutes ago, I met Martin at the end here, who tells me he still makes teapots. <laughs> so we have two rare breeds here tonight. Um, if I start maybe by declaring uh, my interest in being here, I'm very personally pro-manufacturing. I think manufacturing is important for economies. It's, I think, very important for the UK. 
I think it's important for two reasons. One, manufacturing creates a lot of jobs, and they tend to be good quality jobs. And secondly, I think you, you need manufacturing for a balanced economy. If you think about where you individually spend your money, you spend quite a lot of your hard-earned cash on things that are manufactured. And if you want a balanced economy, you probably should be making some of that stuff rather than having to import it all. And, you know, if I look at an equivalent, which is a, is a sort of a natural hedge in Ineos, when we borrow money, if 50% of our income is in dollars, we'll naturally hedge by 50% of that borrowing being in dollars. So if 20% of your spend is in manufacturing, I think 20% of our economy, if we want a robust economy rather than a fragile economy, probably ought to be in manufacturing. But it isn't there today, obviously. Um, so this question behind me, I'm going to, I'm going to change the title slightly. Uh, because my interest is manufacturing. So I'm going to ask, is, has Britain been great for manufacturing? And, and my answer to that is no. It, 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 it really hasn't, in my view. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a moment. I'm going to sound increasingly like that chap, uh, what was he called, Fraser, <coughs> Fraser in Dad's Army. Do you remember? We're all doomed. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I do think there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel. But um, I, I am slightly gloomy about manufacturing, I have to say, at the moment. If, just to give you a bit of context first before I, I get into that. Um, so, sort of credentials, if you like. I, I, I run this company called Ineos, uh, which nobody, will ever, nobody here will have heard of, maybe unless you've read about the Grangemouth dispute. But it, it's sometimes described to me as the largest company nobody has ever heard of, um, which I get a bit fed up with. But, but it is a fact. We don't, have any, we don't have any sort of consumer interfaces. But we are, I mean, we are a chemicals company. One of the largest chemical companies in the world, one of the largest three or four chemical companies in the world. We're, we're very much manufacturing. We have about 100 sites around the world. We produce about, it's very boring, about 50 million tonnes of chemicals. You don't like chemicals, do you? But everything that you touch, eat, look at has got chemicals in it. Metals, pottery, everything is made. Wood, it's all made of chemicals. So whether you like it or not, you depend on us. Um, and we have, about, we have sales of about $50 billion dollars. And we're about the 200th largest company in the world that nobody's ever heard of. So, um, so are these chemicals uh, are these chemicals important? Um, well, chemicals worldwide are bigger than Germany. So that's quite big, really. That's about four and a half trillion dollars. It's quite big in Europe. It's about a trillion dollars. It's about the same size as automotive. Chemicals worldwide is much bigger than bigger than automotive. So. Uh, so sort of that's a sort of few credentials really. So why why do I think there's a problem and why do I sound like the chap from Dad's Army? Um, well, if I look at Ineos, um, about two thirds we have these hundred sites. They're probably worth forty billion dollars to build or something like that. We're all over the place, but about two thirds of them are in Europe, and one third of them are in America. And if I go back five or six years ago, that our profits um, sort of followed suit. So two-thirds of our profits came from Europe and one-third came from America. But today, it's a very, very different world in, in, in our business. And America is now well north of 70% of our profits. And Europe is declining quite rapidly. And if I look at the UK, we're quite big in the UK. We're one of the bigger manufacturers in the UK. Uh, but we make no money in the UK. And we haven't made any money in the UK for about five years. In fact, if I look at where we make money, we make money in predominantly in America, as I've just said, but in Europe, it's Germany and Benelux and uh, Scandinavia. We don't make money in the UK. We don't make money in France. We don't make money in Italy. We don't make money in Spain. And uh, I do recall Shell six or seven years ago doing a review of their manufacturing businesses in chemicals across the world. And they made money in Germany, in Benelux and America, and they didn't make money in the UK, and they didn't make money in France, and they didn't make money in Italy or Spain. So we're, we're maybe not that different. So that's why I think there's a problem. Um, why is there a problem? Um, it's a number of things. I think energy is definitely at the top of the list. Uh, energy in the UK is very expensive. We haven't really found our way, I don't think, or recognized the importance of energy. But an awful lot of manufacturing depends on competitive energy. In our game, competitive energy, sometimes the feedstocks are heavily related to energy as well. If you can't find competitive energy in feedstocks, then you're not going to survive against other parts of the world which do have competitive energy in feedstocks. So, uh, in the UK, gas today is three times the price of gas in the United States. 
that is an enormous difference. And electricity here is double the price of America today. That was not the case six or seven years ago before they exploited shale. Um, and then, you see, I, I'm, I'm sending, sending more and more like Fraser. The, if you look at skills, I think if you go back 30 or 40 years ago in the UK, we, we had a, a very good setup, which was then exactly the same as you will find today in places like Germany and places like Switzerland, where they have highly respected apprenticeships, they have technical colleges, they have polytechnics, they have streaming at the age of 11 or 12, so they don't try and educate a labourer with a nuclear physicist because it's not good for the labourer or the nuclear physicist. Friend. That, and that's what the UK had, and it, it had a, a very good system, I think, 30 or 40 years ago. But it's lost its way once everybody's, you know, once everybody to study media studies and all that silly nonsense, you know. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, you can do a degree in the UK in horse... This is a three-year BA degree in horse psychology. <laughs> I kid you not. I can't find a qualified welder in the UK, but I can recruit somebody who spent three years trying to peer inside a horse's head. <laughs> or whether they ever find anything, I don't know. And then, um, and then the other issue, which you know, if you, if you know anything about Ineos, uh, we've sort of bumped into a few times with the unions, where... I have no issue with the unions, and if you look at any of us, 80% of our sites in Europe are unionised. In America, interestingly, only 20% of our sites are unionised. Europe is much more union-oriented than, than America. We have no issue with unions in, in Europe, but the legislation in the UK needs to be modernised. Uh, and there's a there's sort of silly aspect. I mean, if you look at that Grangemouth dispute, for instance, the unions compelled the employees not to attend the company briefings. So we could not communicate with our employees that we were going bust because the unions wouldn't allow the employees to go. The unions would only allow us to talk to them and they would then talk to the employees. And, of course, they don't, they don't tell the same story. So um, I'll stop whinging about that. Where, where does that leave Britain today? Um, well, 20 years ago, manufacturing in the UK was very, very similar to Germany. It was about 22 23% of GDP, which is where Germany is today. Germany has never n not changed. But and, and if you're not in manufacturing, you probably won't recognise it, but it, manufacturing has collapsed in the UK. And today, manufacturing is 10 or 11% of our GDP. So it's halved over the last um, 15 or 20 years compared to Germany. I don't think that's a good thing. Um, if you look at my industry in the last five years, 22 chemical plant closures in the UK in the last five years, no new investments in the UK at all. So it's a sort of a creeping disease, really, which you don't see. And you sort of, a lot of you here live in a bit of a bubble because you live in this wonderful place in London, but you don't necessarily. You know, if I asked you here how many times in the last year you've been to Chelsea, Knightsbridge, Kensington, Mayfair, compared to where, you know, how many times you've been to Doncaster, Rotherham, Mansfield, <laughs> Bolton, Bradford... I suspect you've spent most of your time down here, but you haven't been up there to see what's happening up there. And, you know, a lot of the north of England depends on manufacturing and industry. And this is a very service... And, it's, and London's a very successful economy, but the, the north is not in the same place, in my view, as London. And, of course, we see a lot of that because our manufacturing's in the north. Um, so the solution... I don't, there are no sort of quick, quick fixes, I don't think, but um, I think at a very minimum we need competitive energy in the UK. We do not have competitive energy at, at, at present. Um, there's a couple of facts about US shale that you may not know, which I think are quite interesting. So there are... The UK, obviously... The, the US have obviously uh, been quite vigorous in exploiting their shale reserves, and there are about 20 shales in the United States, one of which is called the Marcellus, which is one of the biggest ones in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh area. And the Marcellus did not produce any gas six years ago. And today, so this is over a six-year period, today Marcellus is producing, this is a funny unit, you won't know, but 17 BCF a day, so that's 17 billion cubic feet of gas per day. And the total UK consumption is 6 billion cubic feet per day. So over six years, Marcellus is now producing two and a half times the total UK consumption of gas. And the price of gas in America is a third. In addition to that, if you look at chemicals, chemicals was quite moribund in, in America, if you go back seven or eight years ago, because they didn't have any competitive advantages, particularly. They were in the same place as Europe were. But 
Today, the announced capital investments in chemicals in the United States is $150 billion, which is immense. And compare that with what we're seeing in Europe. All we're seeing in Europe is closures in, in chemicals. Um, so if you look at the UK, the UK is sat on huge uh, shale reserves. Um, it, you know, if you think about the UK, lots of hydrocarbons in the UK. We've got lots of coal, we've got North Sea oil, we've got North Sea gas, we've got the gas off East Anglia, they're just finding new oil off Shetland. So I mean, it's got, fundamentally, there's hydrocarbons in the UK. What we've not really done in the UK is ever drilled for hydrocarbons on land as opposed to off land. But there's lots of it. In America, they've drilled over a million, million shale wells, not 5,000 or 10,000. We, we drilled one in the UK. That was the one that we drilled in Blackpool. We didn't do a very good job of it. We, didn't, we couldn't even drill it straight. It was a banana shape. It was absolutely <laughs> crap, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, but in America, they, they've drilled 1.1 million wells. They have not had an environmental disaster, and nothing has fallen down. Um, so, um, I mean, my message really is, uh, so I haven't talked about this particular subject, but my message is don't sacrifice manufacturing to build windmills. We're building lots and lots of windmills, and we're spending a fortune on windmills. They are hopeless at producing electricity. But it, and that does nothing for manufacturing. It, you know, it's about the most expensive way to produce energy on the planet is a windmill. And if you really, really want to produce the most expensive energy on the planet, build a windmill offshore, because it's really <laughs> expensive to build them offshore. And we have built more offshore windmills than the rest of the planet put together. And that's going to do nothing for, for manufacturing. It, you know, it's, it's, it, the electricity is three times the price of the electricity today if you build an offshore windmill. And America is half our price today. But the other problem with windmills, of course, is if you, if you, do, if you look at this scientifically, and you, let's say 100% of our energy in the UK was from windmills, what happens when the wind doesn't blow? Is you then have to put that base requirement in in the, in the form of gas power, power stations. So you've got to build double the capacity. So not only have you spent six times more money than America spent, you've then got to build all these gas power stations as well. So um, just one final fact, and then I'll shut up. Um, um, Europe has spent three times as much money on renewables as America has spent on shale. And shale in America is now almost producing 50% of America's energy requirements. So our three times the amount in Europe, how much is that producing of Europe's energy? Forgetting the fact that we've also got to build surplus, because when the wind doesn't blow, it doesn't produce anything, of course. But it's 5%. So you know, I would ask the question, who looks smarter? Do the Americans look smarter, or do the Europeans look smarter? Um, that's about it, really. But uh, I mean, my, point, <laughs> my, my key point is, you know, we don't pay politicians to sacrifice manufacturing, which is a fundamental part of the economy, to build some bloody windmills. <laughs> anyway, that's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> mm. As they say, follow that. Uh, a bit different. What, one thing I would say, Jim, what, what about 3D printing? What, isn't that going to improve? Sorry? 3D printing, isn't that going to make manufacturing in the UK a little bit easier? <laughs> yeah. The reason I say that is, you know, every, every four years, every four years, the President of the United States gets a section of the CIA, and it's just part of the Department of Defense, and they're going to be doing that. To answer the question for either the re elected president or the newly elected president, uh, to say, what will America look like in 20 years' time? Now, the last time when Obama got re elected, there were two things that they highlighted. One was energy, shale, uh, such that Saudi Arabia will, in 20 years' time will not be America's problem, okay. but China's problem. And the second thing was 3D printing, or, or rather, capital intensive techniques which make labor expensive economies much more effective from a manufacturing point of view. And even a place like China, which has become relatively more expensive, becomes becomes more interesting. So I, whilst I follow the doom and gloom that you just heard. I'm not quite so pessimistic, and I think we're as resourceful as the Germans or the Northern Italians, and I think hope is not lost yet. Anyway, that wasn't what I was asked to, to talk about. So um, you've heard three very erudite um, 
certainly more erudite than I could ever be, uh, exposés on, uh, on uh, business. And I'm going to alter the title slightly, like Jimmy. It has Britain been great for our business? <laughs> like, uh, egotistical, my business. And I, uh, I, 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 had, I, had pre I had prepared a, a turgid piece. And I was coming here. I think, God, this was awful. And I, I thought, what could I, what could I tell you that would be more personal, because you've heard sort of corporate or industrial stuff, as to why you know, we have had some degree of success at WPP, gone from a market cap. If market cap is a good way of expressing it, from one million pounds of market cap, or about one and a half million dollars, I think it was then, in 1985 to 16.6 billion pounds or $27 billion today. And by the way, it's been like the perils of Pauline because it's been cyclical. Terry mentioned four recessions. Uh, I, since running, trying to run WPP, because it is trying to run, since 85, have been exposed to three recessions, which I'll come back to in a minute. The first was in 91, 92. The second was the internet bust of 2001, 2. And the third, which was the most I think a difficult one was the post Lehman bust or Bear Stearns bust or subprime bust or insurance monoline bust of 2009. But everything is cyclical. You know, the moment you start believing that things aren't cyclical is when the trouble starts. So I went back and um, I just saw I identified six or seven things that I just want to mention briefly, which I think contributed to our success so far having said that it's been a fluctuating one and a cyclical one. Now, Dominic mentioned um, the, the start of the, um, the Sunday Times, and it made me think back to what used to terrify us at Sarches, when I was at Sarches from 75 uh, onwards. I was working for James Gulliver from 75 to 77, and then Sarches from 77 to 85, and then at WPP until recent years with the rise of... Uh, digital and the internet and the always on 24-7 news desk. And it was the Friday night call. It was that you sat in your office, you know, you had a long, hard week, which had in invariably involved a lot of uh, airline travel, and you were absolutely exhausted. And I used to live in Hampstead Garden suburb. And I used to get home at about, um, let's say, 7 o'clock on a Friday night, which is the, the Jewish Sabbath. And we always used to have... Um, our, uh, our Friday night dinner. And invariably, I'd have some schnip from the Sunday Times that would call me on a Sunday night, to, with, on a Friday night, with some devastating story that we had to try to suppress. So as you were talking about, you know, whether there was any news that occurred, what you forgot to mention was there was always the leaker on a Friday, uh, and you would get caught late on a Friday night, and you'd have no means of defense. And, of course, the Sunday Times in those days used to go to print at 12 o'clock midday on a Saturday. So the time that you had to respond was always a very fraught time. So it was just like you brought back that memory, which, thank God, has now disappeared, right? Uh, because, because it's continuous, and it's much easier, actually, to try and deal with these things on a 24-7 basis rather than leave it to the end of the week. So that was just one memory. The other memory that came into my mind, flashed into my mind, is... Um, people were talking, it was, where was I in 1964? And the answer was, I was struggling with part, the preliminaries to part two of the tripos at Cambridge in economics. And, you know, I, I was never really very successful at economics. I got a 2-2 at Cambridge. And that was in the days when a 2-2 really meant something. With, gra <laughs> with grade inflation, I would argue that that 2-2 was worth certainly a 2-1, maybe even a lower first. Uh, today, um, but, but in those days, it was just a common or garden 2-2. But I remember when I was at, uh, at Cambridge, and I went on to HBS, to Harvard Business School. <laughs> Apologies, Andrew, for that, uh, bringing that up. I went on to Harvard Business School, and I was at um, HBS from 66 to 68, during the times of the, the Wilson government, and Anthony Wedgwood Ben, as he then was, was the head of the, I think it was called the Department of Trade of Industry, and he dispatched a man called David Frost, not the David Frost, but a David Frost, to try and recruit 
the HBS graduates of our year to come back to the UK for, for jobs. The reason being, if you remember, that personal tax rates at the, at the top rate were 83% on earned income. Unearned income was 98%. And if you factored in wealth tax, which the, the Wilson government brought in, the actual tax rate on your marginal income was 103%. You actually gave back to the government more. So things have changed. <laughs> and things have improved. But it just brought back into my mind that. So let me just dwell for a little bit on the reasons why I think the government and Britain has been good for our business. The first was an education. A lot of these things are apple pie and motherhood. Carolyn mentioned the importance of infrastructure, hard infrastructure, particularly the aviation industry. One of those apple pie and motherhood things that we always talk about, and I'll come back to technology in a, se in a second, is education. I had, I think, a first-class education. I didn't get a first-class degree, but a first-class education here, which I capped off with two years in America. And I think that's very important to remember. And, and Jim talked about the lack of specific technical education, and whether it's horse psychology or not, I totally agree the lack of apprenticeships, and by the way, our business in China, which are our third largest, third largest market, we are, we're working with the Shanghai municipality on effectively a technical college course of four years. We've already set up the school. It's called the WPP Advertising School to provide effectively fellowships or apprenticeships, technical apprenticeships over a four-year period, sandwich courses with us in our industry. So the first thing was education. The second thing was what I would call the institutional framework. When we started WPP, it was a million pounds market cap. Myself and a stockbroker bought 29% of it. It was what we call a shell company, what the French much more elegantly call a coquille. And we, we received institutional backing, investment backing, and an exhi exhibiting of faith in us, which was very considerable because within 18 months, of starting WPP in 1985, in, er, in early 87, we were backed by an equity and debt series of issues, a debt syndicate and an equity issue, to, to buy a company which was 13 times our size. So the second thing I would say that has been great in the context of the UK and institutions, and indeed I personally criticize institutions maybe for being a little bit too short term now, I have to admit that institutional backing and market backing for a strong story, I thought our story was strong, in 1987 and then later in 89, and I'll come on to that in a minute, what happened afterwards, that was very, very important. The, th the third thing is what I would call financial backing and banks. Banks are much maligned and much criticized. But some of you may know our corporate history. In 87, we acquired J. Walter Thompson Company, or JWT Group, which was 13 times our size. In 1989, we bought the Ogilvy Group. Both were hostile acquisitions in a service business, which was unprecedented. Because the, the logic was, you know, service business assets go up and down and lift and in out the door every day. Therefore, you can't do a hostile bid. People forgot the institutional qualities of these service businesses. But in 89, we acquired Ogilvy, and in 91, 92, that first of the, first, the, th the three recessions hit us. And I made a big mistake, uh, which I've admitted to publicly. It's not the first time I've admitted that to a mistake. But, but we made a big mistake of over-leveraging the company with the use of a convertible preferred. So the third very important thing was that in 91 and 92, our banking syndicate backed us, backed me and the management team running the business to resuscitate the business. We did a two, effectively, two restructurings of our business in 92 and 93. And I would call out particularly Morgan Guarantee, as it was then called, who led the banking syndicate that was actually fundamentally important. It, we made a mistake, I made a mistake, but we were backed and supported through an extremely difficult period of time. In other words, I was given another chance and our people were given another chance. So that was really important too. So education, institutional backing, financial backing. The fourth area was, I would say, the UK government. And I would pick out three prime ministers in particular, Thatcher, Blair, and Cameron. Not often popular 
to, to point out. But Thatcher, I think Mrs. Thatcher laid the base through her leadership for some of the things that made it, made it much easier for us to flourish. Blair certainly reinforced that, uh, gave me a knighthood in 2000, which from a personal point of view, my, mother, and my mother's point of view, who was still alive at that time, was extremely important. And last, I would, and, and I think very importantly, the, the Cameron government and the Osborne government, because he's the CFO, uh, sometimes got a lot of criticism for that austerity that they brought in at the beginning of their term. But I think that's been pretty important, and I'll come back to it later, important in the growth and development of double WPP uh, in the UK. The next area I would pick out is technology. Now, we are often thought of in this country of being behind in technology. You, know, you often hear, well, where are the Googles and where are the Facebooks? But digital now accounts for 36% of our $19 billion of revenue or $75 billion of billings. That's the media billings that, we, that pass through our business. And part of the reason that we've been able to cope, and it is very difficult, and I was saying to Carolyn before we started, that, you know, there are two things, challenges, ge geographical or opportunities, geographical and technological. The geographical bit you can sort of figure out. You don't have to be an Einstein to figure that out. The technology bit is very difficult. And that's where the disruption, particularly for legacy business models, comes from. And that's where it's extremely difficult to cope with it. But here in the UK, the interesting thing is that the internet economy, e-commerce, is at a degree of sophistication and a level that you'd rarely find elsewhere. It was the UK that was the second market where Google became the biggest media owner as a whole in the world. I think Denmark was the first one. So the degree of sophistication of digital approach, thinking, technology is very high in this country, and that's been extremely important. And the, the last point I would make uh, is the following. that The last few years, despite what Jim says about the lack of the success in the manufacturing, if I just look at our own business in the last five years, and I looked at it this morning in preparation for this evening, we've increased uh, our revenues, I said, of 19 billion, about 6 billion in the US, about 3 billion. US uh, is our largest market. UK is second largest. China is third at 1.5 billion. We've gone from just over 2 billion dollars of revenue five years ago to over 3 billion, about 3.2, 3.3 billion this year in the UK. We've gone from 12,500 people to just over 16,000 people here in the UK. And in the five years when we had the difficult times at the beginning, things have got better and you know, GDP here is growing at 3.5%, 4% at the moment in front of an election, and I'm cynical enough to believe that the government will make sure going into an election the economy is certainly in good shape and is revving up. The, strat the, the strategy has been, I think by Osborne, has been well nigh perfect actually from an electoral point of view, election point of view. Austerity at the beginning, do the tough stuff at the beginning, and then start to improve as get closer and closer to the election. But in those five years, we've done extremely well. So if I put all that together, education, institutional backing, financial backing and the banks, given another chance when we made a mistake. Now, how many times do people say that in the UK you don't get another chance? That's one of the problems here. In America, you do. I don't think I agree with that. You know, we were given another chance. Government, three, I picked out three in particular, probably unfairly, but I picked them out. And last but not least, we've been able through particularly in the last few years and the, and the years previously, to build the world leader in our industry, despite the, the efforts of a French, uh, a French competitor and an American competitor unsuccessfully to try and unseat us. So I'm very grateful from a personal point of view. I'm very grateful from the fact, it, from the fact that we employ 178,000 people in 111 countries, could have been 112 if the Scottish independence vote had been slightly different in 111 countries. And probably about half a million people depend in one way or another on our company. Dependence, probably that's a conservative estimate. Half a million people depend on our company. And that came from a small teapot and wire basket manufacturer 28 years ago in Dartford in Kent. Thank you very much.
Uh, thanks very much, uh, Martin, and thanks to all our uh, speakers. Now, I've got um, uh, questions for, for the uh, panel, but time is getting on, so I think it's only fair to, um, you've, you've come here, to uh, open it up to Q&A from the uh, audience now. And I think we have um, microphones, I hope we do. And um, who would like to ask the first question? Um, gentleman down here, please. Yeah. Britain has been very good for business for us, but we just want to bank in Austria. The British economy has done extremely well, but Europe is in turmoil. Deflation, whether you accept it or not, is established. The ECP's balance sheet has shrunk to half the size of our balance sheet. The devaluation is not an option for many countries because of the European Union. Quantitative easing has not succeeded. What would your recommendations be to the British politicians to support the European economy when half our trade is dependent on it? And that's a question for the whole panel, please. Okay. Um, Terry, do you want to come in on that one? <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, I feel in, in a strong position to advise the, uh, the European economy what to, to do. Uh, I think from, I mean, from my position, it is, if I look at, first of all, from UK interests, I mean, I am completely signed up to the fact that uh, the Britain does have a very important part to play in Europe, and we have to do what it is we can to maintain that relationship. I worry greatly, and this comes and has back to your question, about what the impact of the Eurozone has, uh, has been and will have on UK's relationship with, uh, with Europe, because the more that, that Europe becomes centered around the Eurozone, the more that uh, the more difficulty that it, it, it brings to us where they start making decisions in a group that does not include us. And actually, you know, at the heart of the matter, I fear a lot of Europe's problems uh, are with the Eurozone. Uh, I don't want to be too pessimistic about, about, in the sense, the future prospects of it, but I think it is a major problem. Uh, and the speed with which the single currency uh, was introduced with a, a large range of countries with very different kinds of, uh, of economies have posed problems. Uh, we see such differences uh, between uh, the countries within that zone. And in the end, as far as I'm concerned, you know, an enormous amount of, uh, uh, a certain, an enormous amount of uh, responsibility then lies with the lead currency, uh, the lead country within Europe, which is Germany, in order to make that system work. And I'm not sure that they have yet been prepared to, uh, to do that. Okay. Uh, Jim, you, you, uh, you spoke approvingly of uh, Germany, which of course is in the heart of the Eurozone. Um, uh, I mean, they get manufacturing right, do they get everything else right? Um, no, I mean, they're obviously struggling a little bit at the moment. I think they, they you know, they have a government which is, which is very, very focused on manufacturing. They're very skilled. They've got lots of critical mass in, in Germany. Um, and for whatever reason, and I've never really fully understood it, they the employees there in Germany are very loyal to, to, to their manufacturing. They, they don't want to leave work uh, and leave the facility in a mess. It's, you know, they, they won't leave it if it's not clean, <coughs> tidy, oiled, working well. And we don't have quite that same approach, unfortunately, in the UK. So, so when, if I compare my facilities in, in, a, in Germany with the UK, it's a bit... It's a bit like buying, I mean, we've, we bought most of these assets from other companies, but it's a little bit like buying a used Mercedes compared to buying a used Rover. <laughs> okay. Or in Italy, like a used Fiat, you know, the, don't ever go to Italy and try to make chemicals, it's very bad news. But, um, they, 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 there isn't, for whatever reason, I've never got my head around it. I mean, we're, we're just as bright, we're just as capable, we're very innovative, we, we, we struggle a little... We're a very innovative country, the UK, but we're, it's quite, we're not as rigorous and as disciplined and uh, as when well, you can see it in the German character. Really. They're very, very good at, at yeah. manufacturing. But if I look generally at Europe, you ask the question, you know, Europe's in a mess, and you know, and why is that really? But if I look at it from my point of view, um, you know, Europe has said no to shale, all over. It said no to nuclear. It's trying to get out of nuclear, and that's and that's Germany both. So no to nuclear, no to you know, we depend on Putin, and we want lots and lots of green taxes. And well, I'm afraid that's just head in the sand stuff. Also, if you look at the European Commission, they've said, we want 20% of the European economy by 2020, so this is the 20, 2020 rule, to be from manufacturing. And manufacturing is going south at a rate of knots in Europe. 
And it's, it's not going to change if you say no to shale, no to nuclear, lots of green taxes. I mean, it's had in the sun stuff, right? It's just not going to work. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Carolyn, you, you gave an example of um, European liberalisation that has worked, open skies, and you're, obviously Europe is very important to you. Does it concern you that problems in the Eurozone will, uh, you know, may make us more Eurosceptic, more likely to want to leave the EU? Yeah, it does. No, very much so. Um, just, just to your point, can I just ask something yes. about Germany? Um, I think it's quite easy to generalise uh, about Germany. I think that um, I completely agree with you about shale. Forty percent of my cost base is fuel, so I think shale has been, you yeah. know, a, a real issue for us. I think nuclear too. So I completely agree with that. You know, Berlin Airport should have opened. This great Brandenburg Airport should have opened um, two years ago. It's still not open. We don't have a date. We have no idea what is going to happen to that airport. And so I think it's quite easy to generalize about the efficiency and the manufacturing excellence uh, of, of, of a country when actually it's, it, 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 it's not always like that. And actually, wasn't there a state subsidy, um, the German scheme, subsidizing employment after Lehman? A lot of German workers were kept, companies were subsidized Massive, yeah. in order to keep workers on. And, and, I think that's and, one of the reasons. And for just like, it. yes, and I think also, you know, you've probably deal with this also, but I have to deal with, I have to deal with a, um, you know, I don't mind doing it. We have constructive relationships with the unions, as do you. I deal with 26 unions across my business. But, you know, I have to deal with a PV, a company council. And you, I mean, it, there are layers of, of, yeah, of um, and, 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 you know, supervisory boards in Germany. So if you're trying to do a joint venture or alliance with a German company, you know, it's, it's complicated. It's really bureaucratic. It's difficult. So I, I, don't, I just think it's not yeah. that easy to generalize about some, somewhere like Germany. So the answer is yes, I'm very worried about the fact that okay. we're going to let all of this overshadow um, do, the I, benefits of Europe. I do remember the, the first time we bought a really large facility in Germany, which is in Cologne, and it's the second largest uh, chemical facility in, in Germany. And we'd, we'd owned it for about three months, and I went there to visit it for the first time. And um, we had a, a, a cup of coffee and a get-to-know-you session with the, with the union leader for the site. There was about three or 4,000 people on the site with the union leader. And we had a, his name was Siggy, enormous bear of a man. Uh, and he was very polite, as the, the Germans are, very civilized, very polite. After about 20 minutes of drinking tea, he said to me, Jim, I don't like your bonus scheme. And I said, well, why is that, Siggy? Because it's a very generous bonus scheme. And it's a bonus scheme which goes all the way through the employees. It's not just a bonus scheme for senior management. He said, I would rather you spend the money on the plant. It would be better to spend the money on the plant rather than pay bonuses to everybody so that this plant that was here will be here for the next generation and the generation after that. And that's a rather different attitude to the attitude we had with the unions in Grangemouth. Okay. They just wanted a fight. Right? Yeah, just, Martin. Uh, yeah. If the question had been, will Britain be great for business or indeed for our business, the biggest issue is the, the issue behind the question, which is if the Conservatives uh, lead the next government, whether they have a majority, an overall majority, or the largest party, and I think it's likely more likely they'll be the largest party. So we will have a referendum on the EU in 2017. I think that is the biggest issue that we will have to face. Um, you know, from a personal point of view, I believe that being inside the tent is better, arguing for better system, less bureaucracy, and all the things that we would like to see, less red tape, less rules and regulations, and more flexibility. I think it's better to be in. I think if we come out, which currently, if we had a poll maybe, if we had a referendum now, we would probably come out. My, my hope is, and it's actually behind the question, that what we're seeing at the moment, which is quantitative easing coming off in America, the Fed pulling back, at the same time as Japan is now action QE, and Draghi still hasn't got Western Europe. And by the way, there are two, two, two Europes, Eastern Europe and Western Europe. In fact, there's a Western continental Europe. The, the key economies from that point of view are obviously Germany and France, Italy, and Spain. And remember that that economy is a $16 trillion, the Eurozone is a $16 trillion economy, same size as America. The Chinese are about $9 trillion, the world's about 72, 73. So I think that issue is the key issue. And that is the thing that worries me if we put the, the question in the future tense 
That is the biggest threat. That's the biggest cloud on the horizon as to what happens. And my one hope is that with what's going on at the moment with Draghi trying to get the Western European economy going or continental European economy growing, with the Japanese trying to do what they're doing, although I haven't seen much improvement structurally in Japan as, as, as of yet, my hope is that by 2017, if we were to have that referendum, the psychology may change and we may see a vote in favour of staying in rather than coming out. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we, the polls are all over the place, as you know, on, uh, on Europe. But we've, we've just had one that was said that support for staying in was at a 23-year high, unusually, yes. which may be a, a response um, to the rise of UKIP. I don't know. But, uh, but anyway, we'll see. Uh, next question. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, well, gentlemen there, and then we'll take the lady on the front next. Yeah, thank you. To what extent do you think Britain can validly be regarded as one country? Because uh, I think, as Jim mentioned, uh, if you look around you out these windows, things look spectacularly uh, you know, impressive. But uh, if we were sitting here in Hartlepool or somewhere, I suspect the outlook would, um, would look uh, rather different. And uh, I think there's an argument for saying, well, Britain has generally done things which have, on balance, pretty good for service, international service-oriented businesses. But there's a lot of uh, non-London-based businesses which have really gone through you know, 20 or 30 years of steady decline. Okay, thank you. Good question. Um, Terry, I mean, you, uh, you came down to the London Business School from the northeast. Yes. Um, and you, uh, the successes you mentioned, uh, financial services, creative and media, tend to be London-dominated. Um, and we've seen this enormous shift of corporate power away from the regions down to London and the southeast. Does that, does that concern you? <laughs> well, it is a problem, but... I don't think you make the rest of the country better off by, in a sense, seeking to make the, the South worse off. I mean, I think we should celebrate the enormous success of, uh, of what has happened in those industries that have been successful. And the next stage is how it is that we can revitalize uh, the, uh, the North uh, and the Northeast, which is where I, I was born and where I lived um, uh, before I came to London. Uh, it, replacing those old traditional industries in places like the Northeast is a long and very difficult uh, task. I mean, things are, I think there have been a lot of change. There are things that are better. Places like Newcastle are, are doing very well. And uh, indeed, you see quite a lot of service industries that have moved into those uh, areas. And you know, I appreciate as much as, as anyone the, the, the challenges that they, uh, that they face. But... You know, I, I, what I worry about enormously is when the, if the, when the question is posed that implies that somehow or other that we would be able to improve the lot of the North by slowing down what it is mm -hmm. that is happening in the, in the South, which I, I really don't believe. Yeah, okay. Good. Um, Jim, I mean, you, in your uh, private Fraser um, uh, assessment of manufacturing, uh, you, you, you um, I mean, one of the success stories of recent years has been motor manufacture in the UK, um, uh, in, including, as Terry says, in the Northeast, but also in other places which, which weren't traditional areas for motor manufacture. No. I mean, is that, is that something that can be replicated, do you think, in other industries? Well, it... You just have to look at the history of the last 15 years. Manufacturing has gone from 22, 23% to 10%. So. Yeah. But I mean, that, I think that's there's happened clearly in, been some successes. Too. Yeah, that's yeah, pretty yeah. precipitous decline, really. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the only... I, I mean, you need to give the North some competitive advantages for their industries, which is, you know, better skills, cheap energy, whatever, so that they can develop... They, they need jobs, really. So, you know, jobs are created. It, there's no point sending the Inland Revenue up there and... Lots of people working for the civil service. Those are not, you know, high-quality jobs, really, in my view. You yeah, need sure. proper manufacturing. But I think an interesting example <laughs> is if you go... I don't know if anybody here has been to Pittsburgh, uh, which is an old steel town in America. If you went there 20 years ago, it, it, it would, you would see it in the same light as you'd see some parts of the north of England, which is quite depressed, high unemployment, very little investment. <coughs> and if you go back today, it's an extraordinarily vibrant place because there's an immense amount of money being generated through shale, not just from the energy that you produce, but all the jobs that it creates as well. And you know, an awful lot of the industrial north is sat on you know, very sizable pieces of shale, and there's lots of, um, there's lots of energy in there. So lots of jobs and lots of economic value. For yeah. I mean, America has got a very similar share of manufacturing in GDP as we have in the UK, and seen a, seen a similar decline. 
Yeah. You think they can turn well, that around? Sort of reversing. You, think, moment, you think they genuinely can turn that around in a way well, that we, you don't think we billion can? Well, 150 billion in chemicals alone is immense. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Martin, do you want to say something? Uh, well, I, I, I just sort of, so, sort of feel that, in a way, there's almost an inevitability about it. There, there are people who believe in long-term industrial waves and or commercial waves. And if you went back to the early 19th century, around about 1825, China, the Brit, the, what we call now the BRICS, and, or Jim O'Neill calls the BRICS, we used to call the BRICS mm. the next 11, were 40 to 50% of worldwide GDP. They then started to decline. You know, Wedgwood and Meissen China were lower cost China that we produced in Britain and Germany to compete against the Chinese porcelain mm. industry. Mm. It was the same, better quality at lower prices. So, the, you know, this is, in a sense, we're, we're sort of back to the, the future. And I think this is a big issue that we have to deal with. That's one thing. The second thing is, when I referred to where, where I was in 1964, when I came out, when I was at Cambridge, Keynes in Economics was the vogue. Calder, Khan, Joan Robinson. Joan Robinson we used to walk around Cambridge in her Chinese commune gear. And Keynesian economics, what was it? It was the Phillips curve, right, at London School of Economics. You know, what's the level of inflation we're prepared to tolerate at zero unemployment? Now it's completely the reverse. It's what's the level of unemployment that we have to have at zero inflation. So there's a complete reversal of, I think, government economic policy. And the downside of that is that we have unemployed people in various parts of this country. And the biggest problem we have is not the general level of unemployment, it's youth unemployment. Because in every country that I come across, the general level of employment, the, the youth unemployment is double the level of, of general employment. So you go to Spain, 20%, it's 40%, right? If it's here in the UK, 6 or 7%, it's 15%. That is where the decay. Now, I, I think, and maybe this is economically impossible, a little bit of inflation is certainly good for us. And our clients have very little pricing power. Therefore, they can't influence the price at which they sell goods and ultimately after manufacture. So post layman, they become extremely cautious. Since the early 90s, we have had very little inflation. The rise of finance and procurement has made them very short term. And they, they pull in their horns on labor and employing labor the moment that their top line starts to soften. And in this world, post layman in particular, growth is sub-trend, meaning it was growing faster pre layman than it is post layman And most companies are not getting the top line growth that they need. They're very conservative. They're very short term. They're sitting on $4.2 trillion of net cash with very little leverage. Corporate governance works against people taking risks. And I'll leave you with one set of statistics which I think is riveting. Average life of a CEO in a company is five years. Average life in America. Average life of a CFO in America is three years. Average life of a chief marketing officer who we have to deal with is two years. What is the net result of that? A, a resistance to taking risk. And I think the employment issue and the lack of willingness of corporations to invest heavily, which is part of the manufacturing problem, because I, I think some of those manufacturers are unwilling to, is, okay. is a real problem. OK. I mean, we have seen, obviously, a very, pretty strong growth in employment in this country. But uh, yeah, you know, was, but that, was that the point I, you were going to make? Uh, 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 yeah. Actually, we, in terms of unemployment, on a national level, we are doing uh, very, very well by comparison to others. And the speed with which we have come, in that respect, out of the, uh, the recession. Uh, obviously, the, there are lots of issues about the the quality of those jobs and, uh, and levels of, of average earnings. But compared to what has been going on in, uh, in Europe and in a lot of places, uh, I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of, particularly when you look at the, the whole question of the number of, 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 of migrants coming to the UK. The other point I should go make is the extraordinary paradox. When I think of the, the number of years of my life that I spent trying to get inflation down uh, to now be watching people who are beginning to panic uh, about getting inflation up is the sort of, I really think that I have, uh, in a, that, that I've gone full circle in this world. And it is, uh, it is bizarre. Right, okay, uh, excellent. Let's, um, 
If, uh, let's take a, a couple of questions. I think we're almost out of time, but if we take uh, you, you, your question first. Do we have another one? There's one at the back. No, you, no you've had one. Uh, one there. Um, yeah, I'll pass the mic. So take yours first, yeah, and then we'll, uh, yeah. I'm interested to hear really your view on the future of the creative industries, and in that I include sort of digital, 3D printing, and software. Um, bearing in mind the kind of reduction and sort of huge cuts in the arts and culture industry, and equally the kind of deprioritization of arts within the curriculum. Um, how do you see that bearing out, and, and what are your kind of views um, in terms of the future of your uh, companies and uh, okay. companies that okay. you care about? We've got that one. Uh, and let's take the other question and we can take them t together. Yeah. I work in the digital and technology sector, so it's kind of a combination of the last two. We're obviously moving to an, a world where technology is increasingly a massive part of GDP. It's now raised to about a third of GDP. It'll, soon it looks like overtake tourism to become the second largest provider of economic growth in the UK. How much do you think that's a problem when it's the two largest, what will soon be the two largest sectors of GDP in the UK being banking and finance and digital sector are so heavily biased towards the southeast. and do you think that's a problem and if so what should be done about it and if not why do you want that view? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, who wants to come in on the creative industries? Um, Terry, do you want well, to do I, it? Uh, and, and Martin. I, but, I, think, I think the, the creative industries in this country are in, in very good shape. Uh, I mean, I mentioned in my, in my remarks about the, the broadcasting industry, and we have you know, got this extraordinary, vibrant, independent uh, television production uh, world, companies which have been, you know, the Americans are, are paying fortunes to get their hands on. The, but I also see it in the music world. I mean, the people, you know, the great musicians of the world want to come to, to London. They want to live here. They come to be trained here at the, the conservatoires that we have had. Uh, it is, there are probably more concerts and more plays that take place in, uh, in, in the UK than uh, anywhere else uh, for its, uh, its size. It's the same points that I was making about some of the other areas. As a platform, as a place that people want to come in order to do their work, it is very healthy. Martin. Well, I just, I just yeah, Claire's question. To, today, the, the Italian opera, uh, or the orchestra, for the Italian, for the uh, Rome Opera House, were striking because the orchestra is being reduced by half because they're, they're losing money. And so it was interesting that you raised that question. But I think really fundamentally it comes back to, it's a very interesting question is, new technologies do create jobs, but they also are disruptive. They shorten supply chains. So Gay and Larry at Google, what business are they really in? They're in the disruption business, the disintermediation business. And they attack, for good reasons for you and me as consumers, because they deliver goods and services at lower prices. And we will be forever grateful to Google for doing it. But what they do is that they reduce levels of employment in supply chains that have been much longer and much more complicated. The big question is whether these new technologies create more jobs than they destroy. And it's a bit related to the question about the Southeast and the role of the South. That, I think, if you relate that to the difference in economic policy to when I was a nipper or when Terry was in the Treasury, whatever, I think that's the, <laughs> that, that, that is the key question. And I, I, I am pessimistic about that. And, and if you ally that, you ally that with the, with the propensity for companies not to invest. Yeah. That you can go, we went into the 30 year bond market at 5.6% gross dollar last year. We went into the 30 year market, not built for advertising agencies, but for energy companies and manufacturing companies. We went into the euro market a few months ago at 2.25% for 12 years gross into the dollar market at 10% as, uh, for 10 years at 3.35. The euro market means we could buy a company, that's the gross cost, 2.25, probably 1% after tax or a little bit more. We could buy a company for 100 times earnings without mm -hmm. feeling the pinch, at least in theory, in the short term. OK, Martin, yeah, that's so, fine. Yeah, uh, uh, Carolyn, quickly. Just, yeah. just to your point, I'm, I'll just pick up. I mean, I think we are, we have amazing creative talent in this country. And, you know, all of us have worked with 
in, in businesses that have really fostered that. I think that, you know, we forget that some of our, some of the biggest ad agencies in the world, you know, that were founded in the UK, BBH, is an example, sorry, but, you know, that, that's true. And, uh, and lots of small credit. But not, but not I, very big characters. Well, they're global now, Martin. You know, they are global. Anyway, it's just an example. But just an the example. Time. They're now owned by French. But I just, we do forget that. And I think that, that, that just your point about the Arts Council, I think what's been really interesting is that, you know, our, uh, I, I, have, I, do, I work a bit with the Royal Academy, which, you know, no one subsidizes, right? So it has to raise all its money from its own coffers, right? It raises it itself. And they have never, I mean, their footfall is amazing. So is every other gallery in London and in Liverpool and in Manchester. So this is not just about London. There is some, you know, amazing stuff that's been done in the North um, and in Cornwall for that matter and in Margate for that matter. So, you know, we have this, uh, we have done this. And what is amazing is that I take your point about schools and the cuts, which I'm you know, I, I feel very opposed to. But what all of these galleries and museums have done, and they're all, all free uh, to the British public, is they've created schools programs uh, for all schools around the country. So I think that helps foster a lot of creativity coming through. They all have programs. They all have um, subsidised programs, actually, for, you know, for... for yeah. So I think, you know, actually, we're not in a bad place on that, but we've got to foster it. My biggest worry is web development skills. Just to that gentleman's point in the back, I think one of the things we really need to think about as, a, as an economy is how we... The biggest skills gap, I think, actually, is, um, is web development. Code, because code is a language in code, it, Yeah, and we just need to do much more okay. on that in education. Yeah, great. Now, I, I can't yeah, see anybody... Great. We are, we are beyond time, and I, but I can't see anybody waving their hands at the back. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the rules here and ask for a couple more questions just to finish off, and then we, it'll have to be finished off. So, uh, um, gentlemen with the uh, distinguished um, grey hair. The, the panel have all pretty much treated the question, has Britain been great for business? It's meaning, has Britain been great for big business? Given that politicians are always going on about SMEs, is that a recognition that small business is really, the day of the small business is over and it's not really contributing? Uh, okay, okay, yeah. And the lady here? Uh, yeah. I just wanted to know how important the tax regime is for uh, the success of Britain's business. I mean, WPP very publicly moved their headquarters from Britain to Ireland. And I sort of wondered whether there was any sort of Sense of guilt about that. Okay. Wait a minute. 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 We were told that the Treasury were going to tax unremitted earnings overseas, which would have made uh, our tax position extremely difficult. So we moved before, and not the only one actually moved before, uh, several other businesses too. When the coalition uh, came into power, the Conservative coalition, they wanted, in fact, they wanted us to come back before the election. Uh, and which we indicated we were not prepared to do that unless we had some form of guarantee through legislation that uh, you know, we were going to have, uh, let's say, a level playing field uh, as far as we're concerned. The coalition then did that. They introduced legislation. And I would just point out that legislation only life lasts for the life of the parliament. So to your point about guilt or doing the right thing, in effect, we did the right thing. There were, there were people on our board who felt Having gone out, we should stay out. We felt it was the right thing, having been given effectively a legislation guarantee that for the life of this part of the parliament, the position would change, wouldn't change, we would come back. Okay. So we put ourselves at risk in that sense. So in a way, whether you call it guilt or conscience or the right thing to do, we came back. Okay, thank you. Uh, who wants to come in on the general question of uh, tax regime and on whether SMEs are still valued in this country? I'll say something about SMEs. Yeah. I mean, I think SMEs are highly valued. I think we've been doing some work with uh, looking at small companies uh, to do with artificial intelligence. And it's been very interesting because um, actually all of them that we've been talking to have been saying, you know, this is, uh, it's very easy to start up a company, 
the tax regime is very, very sympathetic to them. The entrepreneur relief at 10 million pounds is a fantastic thing. It was just five years ago, one million pounds. So actually there is quite, you know, if you just go to the kind of Eastern corridor, there's a lot of new and small businesses that are thriving. So I think actually in the last five years, things have improved for small to medium sized business. Just an example, ASOS, I think is a, you know, they started with two people. They're a digital company. They're one of the most fast paced uh, retailers now, and they're a UK company. So they started as a tiny company. I, mean, I, I completely agree with Carolyn about this. I mean, in terms of where the work I'm doing at the moment, I mean, the whole SME market is, it seems to be in very good shape. I mentioned the broadcasting industry where Channel 4 does business with an enormous number of very small companies who are making uh, television uh, programs, and many of them, of course, are becoming bigger, and eventually they, they look to, uh, to sell on. And on the banking side, the demand and you know, the exciting things that you see as we try to, uh, to get Santander more involved in the uh, SME business in the UK, I have found to be enormously impressive in terms of the, the demand that there is out there for finance and the people who really have got very good ideas. And, okay. uh, and it seems to me there's more of an entrepreneurial culture, actually, than I can, rem I can recall at any stage in, uh, in my working life. And it's, as you've already heard, Martin, say that's been quite a long time. Okay. Wait a minute. Jim, last word to you, either on tax regime importance of or, uh, or SME? Tax regime, I think, you know, if a, if a country will offer low tax rates, it will improve investment because it will, it will influence investment decisions as you've seen in Ireland. Yeah. You know, it attracted lots of investment in Ireland. On SMEs, um, I live in Switzerland, there are 22,000 manufacturing companies employing 20 people or more. Um, and it's an enormously successful economy and it's got the highest labour rates in Europe. But, uh, Okay. SMEs are the sort of bedrock of the Swiss economy. Yeah. Martin, yeah. last word One to the youngster on, on the end. Right. The big, banks are not lending. One of the biggest threats to SMEs is this extension of payment terms by large companies. The unwillingness. You know, the asking for 90 days credit, 120, day, 120 days credit. I've even seen 180 days credit. Small companies can't finance. And that's, I think, the biggest threat at the moment. Something has to be done about that. Okay. There are some other things I won't bore you with in relation to procurement policies, but that elongation of payment terms, I think, is the biggest issue. Okay, uh, we have run out of time. Can we thank uh, the panel for all their contributions? <laughs> <laughs>